I don't want to eat anymore. My daughter is only six, but she knows how to project her voice. And she's only about this high, I know, because when I get down on my knees and give her a hug, we're the perfect height. But this particular day, I wasn't too much feeling like giving her a hug. It was Saturday, and I was tired. And I had made food for both of my kids. My older daughter, Akila, had eaten all of her food. My younger daughter, Lena, had touched nothing, and she drove the fork around on the plate, round and round and round. I said, Lena, you have to eat your food. Why? She said, Lena, you have to eat your food because it's nutritious. I don't care about nutritious. Lena, you're going to be hungry later. How many bites can you eat? Zero, she said. <laughs> so I said, look, Lena, you're just going to you're just going to have to sit there until you finish your food. I don't care, she shouted. Now, I also wanted to shout. I wanted to take a nap. <laughs> I thought about giving her a timeout, or at least threatening one. One time, she had taken the bowl of Cheerios and just pushed it off the table. And there was milk and there was Cheerios all over the floor. And I said, Lena, I'm going to have to give you a timeout. And I took her to the bathroom. And I put her in the bathroom, and I closed the door, and I held the door. Now, the, the book I was reading said that um, you weren't supposed to la let the timeout last a minute longer than the child's age, but also that they were supposed to come out calm and cool and collected, almost like the symphony was playing, right? <laughs> Now, that wasn't happening. What was happening was banging on the door, bang, bang, bang. And it wasn't particularly rhythmic. And I said... This is ironic. Here I am, a criminal justice reformer, holding my daughter in a bathroom the same size as a cell. We were jailer and jailed. Now, look, I get it. Uh, how many of you have been challenged by being a parent or a caregiver? Right? I see a lot of hands. I'm looking for my mom. I'm hoping she's not raising her hand too high. Um, look, when we're tired and we're demoralized, it's easy to take the authoritarian shortcut. But we miss things. And what my older daughter reminded me is that we can also breathe in those moments. She's taking a social emotional learning class in, in, in school. And she said, Dad, when you get angry, Mom, when you get angry, just breathe. So I took a couple deep breaths, because I knew I didn't want to give her a timeout. I knew I didn't want to do that. But I also didn't know what I was going to do. So I took a breath. And that's when I noticed something. I noticed that it wasn't true that she hadn't eaten anything. She had actually finished all of her broccoli, which was ama amazing, because I didn't even know she liked broccoli. I said, Lena, you didn't eat the rest of your food, but you ate all of your broccoli. Yeah, she said. How about I give you more broccoli instead of the rest of your food? Okay, she said. Okay, was how I interpreted it. I was scared. Because as a parent, there's so many things to screw up. There's so many things that we're worried about making sure that they're safe. And in those moments, we just want them to eat. And so I said, because she's tiny, she's little. I said to her, Um, you know, I said to myself, like, th this isn't how I, wanna, how I want to be as a parent. So, um, when, when we take those shortcuts, it's understandable. We want them to be safe and healthy, but what we don't always realize is those shortcuts actually short-circuit our relationship they make it harder for us to remember that we want them to eat because we love them, we care about them, right? Now, thankfully, my day job as the executive director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights is a lot easier than being a parent. <laughs> Now, and we work to end mass incarceration, so that says something. But uh, thankfully, a lot of you all are recognizing that those same authoritarian shortcuts that got me in trouble at the lunch table have gotten us in trouble as a country. We have 
just 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. Nearly one out of two, nearly half of U.S. children have a parent with a criminal record. And so it is not just individuals, but entire families and communities that are impacted because we've invested in this uh, punishment dragnet rather than investing in a social safety net. What I need you to know is that it gets a little bit worse still, because when you add up those shortcuts from home to home, from city to city, from prison to prison, from country to country, what you will find is that we've reached a global tipping point. Across the world, we see the rise of dictators and despots. And our country is no exception. Because we have this punishment dragnet and not a social safety net, one lost job, one health care crisis, one traffic stop can be the end of life as we know it. But there is good news, and I know you're waiting for it. The good news is that we have what we need to be safe, that that lesson from my lunch table is transferable to cities and states and our country. And I want to give you three examples. First, Richmond, California, right here close by. The year is 2005. The entire city was overwhelmed by violence. And the police had clear evidence of who was responsible for the violence in Richmond. There was only 30 people on this list. They were responsible for some 70% of shootings in Richmond. They had tried all of the punitive measures that they could try. And that's when Devon Bogan came to town. He was a youth mentor. He said, I have a different idea of what we could do. He said, I want to focus on violence prevention. I want to develop a fellowship program for these young people. And the city council, having tried everything else, said, sure, please. Now, he brought those young people in various groups to the, uh, one of the finest conference rooms in Rich Richmond, overlooking all of Richmond. And he said to them, Everyone is up in arms trying to figure out what do we do about violence. And yet no one has asked you what you think should be done. And I'm sorry about that. He said, I want to engage you, and he did. And he told them, I have an 18-month fellowship program to offer you. It includes of three components. One, daily positive contact. Two, a monetary stipend. And three, travel opportunities so you can expand your horizons. Now, these young people enrolled, they were excited, but the city was less excited because the press got news of this. And they said to Devon, Devon, let me get this straight. You are paying people not to shoot each other. And you are using city resources to do so? Devon said yes, and the city backed him partly because it was working. From 20, 2007 to 2014, there was a 77% drop in homicides in the city of Richmond. <laughs> and the, the press focused on these monetary stipends, but what he found, it was the daily positive contact. It was these travel opportunities. He told young people, you can travel to South Africa with us. You can travel out of the country with us but you have to go with your neighborhood rival. And over time, they built the trust to take these trips. And as they took these trips, the walls between them came down, and the whole world opened up. You see, where other folks had re regarded these young people as the problem, Devon saw them as his family. And that made the difference. That made the difference not just for those young people, but for the entire city of Richmond, because parents could send their children out to play and elderly folks could leave their homes without fear. Now, the second story that I want to tell is one closer to, to my own experience. When I came out of law school, I was hired to build a statewide network of families of incarcerated youth. You want to talk about fearful parents. These parents had children who they knew were being tortured. 
23-hour day isolation was the norm inside the California Youth Authority youth prison system. Young people were subjected to those conditions for weeks and months on end. There were videotaped beatings of young people inside of these institutions. And you can imagine being a parent, traveling hundreds of miles to see your child, not knowing in what state you might find them. And a guard telling you, you can't visit today because you have on the wrong pants. You can't talk to each other in the visiting line. You can't visit today because your child's entire unit is on lockdown. Now, faced with these facts, these families didn't despair. What they said is, we want to set a goal, we want to close these youth prisons down because we know we can do better than this. The, the first thing we did was set that goal. The second thing that we did was get some good t-shirts. You may not know this, but as a good organizer, you have to have a good t-shirt. On the front, it said, close CYA prisons. On the back, it said, open youth opportunities. And we went to the Capitol in Sacramento with our t-shirts, very much eager to talk with legislators. They were less eager to talk with us. They tried to close the doors in our faces. They, they tried to laugh us out of the Capitol, but we persisted. What started as a handful of families grew to over a thousand families strong. They said we would never close a single youth prison, but we persisted. And this wasn't a kind of power in numbers uh, story. This was something different. We didn't make them pay a political price. What we did was show them that families cared about their kids, that they were traveling great lengths just to stay in contact. And as they did, they were persuaded, those legislators who said, we would never close a single youth prison, they were right. We closed five youth prisons across the state of California. And that wasn't just a win for human rights, it was a win for all of your safety because youth crime continued to decline during that same period. And I think even more than being a win for safety, it was an example of the promise of our democracy, which is e pluribus unum. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> but I know that it means out of many, one. That we all have an opportunity to participate in our democracy. Unfortunately, our criminal court system is all about two sides. And when you have a two-sided justice system, it tends to reinforce the existing divides among us, between rich and poor folks, between people of color and white folks, between men and women. And authoritarians take that us versus them soup of a punitive justice system, and they turn it into national policy. And so now all of us see and can see and feel the fear around us. But what I need to, you to know is that there is a different vision, that there is an alternative. And it isn't just represented by youth in Richmond or families in California, it's represented by all of us, and it's embodied in this vision called restorative justice. How many people have heard of restorative justice? Can you raise your hand? I see a lot of hands up. And so you all will know that restorative justice is this process through which people are held accountable and yet still held in community. It recognizes the wisdom of some of the pre previous speakers who said, we all make mistakes. And it takes, a it takes a step further to say, each of us is more than our worst mistake. Restorative justice is a win, win, win. That is three wins, not just two. It's a win for those who have caused the harm because people who go through a restorative just justice process are much less likely to get in trouble with the law again. Victims report much higher satisfaction rates with restorative justice. And finally, all of us benefit as a community because it isn't just those two individuals who are held in circle, it is their entire network of support. And all of those people are asking, how did this harm happen? What could I have done differently? What could we have done differently to stop it from happening again? What could we have done differently to transform the situation moving forward? And I think that those are the questions that all of us need to be asking ourselves in this country in this moment. And I know these can be some overwhelming times. 
that these can be difficult times. But let's remember that we can pause, that we can breathe. That when we breathe, we might see something that we haven't seen before. That when we can see, we can choose. We can choose love. We can choose hope over fear. And when we make those choices, we will find that we are safer together, that each of us is more than our worst mistake, and that by transforming our justice system, we might just rescue our democracy. Thank you.